Institute of Public Health in Mexico, and he'll be talking about strategies strategies to address under and over nutrition in developing countries, specifically Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, and sorry for being late. It was a start of the traffic coming from the other city, that is Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Who's, who's with that? <laughs> thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to, to be here. I'm very excited. I, I've been, since, since my brother and I were students at the graduate school, uh, you probably know my brother, Santiago Lopez Fridaura, and when he was in the agriculture, his doctoral degree, and I was in the nutrition epidemiology degree, we always talk about the possibility of joining um, the research of both areas. In that time, some years ago, it wasn't very clear about the need and, and the importance of this, but it's coming like every, like in the last five years, there's, there's been a lot of cost proposals and a lot of initiatives trying to integrate the research that we as a nutritional epidemiologists are doing, collecting data on, data on diet and intakes in the population, and whatever data you are as an agronomist or agricultural or food sciences are collecting to understand what the main drivers of the current health problems in the world. So, um, so I really, th I think this seminar is a huge step towards this uh, uh, dream that my brother and I had some years ago by having a proposal together. And I think it will come through. So this is the outline. I will try to cover in 20 minutes. Yes. I will talk mainly about uh, about Mexico and talk about the data that we have about the technological transition in Mexico. And I will spend a little bit of time on um, describing the concept of double burden of malnutrition, specifically and the data in Mexico. And about the nutritional transition concept about how diet and changes in the population. And then I will just de describe what are the major strategies here in Mexico uh, to tackle these both kinds of nutrition problems, and then talk about some conclusions and opportunities for collaborations. So many you know uh, well uh, uh, about this concept of this phenomenon of uh, epidemiological transition over the last two to three decades in Mexico and in many other low and low income countries, there's been a rapid change in the mortality and morbidity of the population. This is an analysis that we had with the mortality data here in Mexico. Uh, so this is uh, just taking the mortality data that is publicly available uh, from the <coughs> of INEGI, and we just did to describe and calculate the mortality rate, HHOS mortality rate, in the last two to three decades. And there's been a lot of an, an impact uh, reducing importantly those diseases clearly associated with undernutrition and poverty that are uh, infectious diseases Infectious diseases, mainly from the upper respiratory and, and, and lower respiratory infections, but also diarrhea. But the other two diseases that are really increasing importantly in Mexico is uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And now, in all the states, also both rural and urban population, these are the major uh, causes of death among adults, and is pushing most of the health expenditures. Uh, there's another metric that, that we call uh, disability adjusted life year that is kind of a combination of not only mortality but also 
in the, the years that you the, a patient spent with a disease and then with disabilities because of the disease. So is how many years you lost because of a disease, uh, given your life expectancy, and how many years with the disease you spent, and this they this combines the burden, the global burden of disease metric that is the the values. And this is that there is a, a huge effort at the global level to collect data on on the different risk factors and and diseases. And this is the case in Mexico for the global burden of disease data, where you can also see that that this is also more importantly than only the mortality, that you can see that diabetes, ischemic heart disease, chronic kidney disease are the major uh, health problems that, is, that are uh, causing the disability in the population. Whereas other that were very important in the 90s now are lowing down to the lower level of disability <coughs> in terms of the burden. But this level is kind of in, uh, unequal. So there's a, uh, the, as you can imagine, there, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the population in Mexico and in many other middle-income countries. And, and so the problem is that, and one of the main variables that define the heterogeneity is poverty. So, but, but sometimes there's been this discussion about how important is obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease among the rural and among the, the poorest population in Mexico. But we can see this is also taking this with an analysis with the global burden of disease data that we only just try to explain what among these major risk factors for for, for non communicable disease, overweight and obesity, high blood pressure, glucose levels and cholesterol levels, and how the the trends in the mortality associated with these risk factors are different in terms of the population. So we can see that for some risk factors such as overweight and obesity, we can see the mortality associated in the upper or the highest income uh, category are already decreasing you know, from, the, from the 90s to the 2010 uh, estimates. Whereas in the lower or the lowest quintile, these are increasing importantly uh, the mortality associated with both obesity and glucose levels. In terms of the, of the high blood pressure and cholesterol levels, we can see the decrease, importantly for the, for the upper quintiles of income, not really changes, many changes in the levels. So, I, we, well, with your hat, there's been this, what is driving this NCDs epidemic at the, at the global level, at the, at the low middle income countries. And clearly, obesity is one of the driving, of the major driving forces of this NCDs epidemic. This is the data from the four last national surveys in Mexico. The first one was in 1988, 1999, 2006, and 2012. There's some new data coming up from the 2016 survey, eh, but the, there's not many changes with the 2012. So in the 2012, among the adult population, we found that in this survey at the national level, 72% of the population is either overweight or obesity, or obese. And these have been a, a shift of the population, that the entire population is shifting towards a heaviest uh, weight. And, and the increments per year, although declining in terms of, uh, of the rate of change per year, but it's still increasing from 2000 and 2012. But what happened with the other, with the, with the other extreme of the dual border? This is the estimate that we do have for the, from, from the same surveys from 88 to the 2012, and here I include the 2016 estimates. And about the main indicators or metrics for evaluating undernutrition in the population, especially in the children uh, below or younger than five years old. So we can see there's these, and you are surely familiar with these indicators, there's like three major indicators for the childhood undernutrition problems. One that we call underweight, that is lower 2C scores of the weight for age, stunting that is height for age, 
and weighting that is weight for height. Weighting, let's call it something like acute undernutrition problem, is more associated with acute episodes of infection. They lose a lot of a lot of weight rapidly. Whereas the starting is more uh, indicator of a chronic undernutrition problem. And other ways is kind of a combination. So, so there's been an important uh, uh, decrease in the estimates from the 80s to the 2016. And I think in terms of the underweight and the wasting, we are getting more to our bottom <coughs> that level. Whereas in the starting, that there's a lot of we still have a 10% of the child of the childhood in Mexico. The children in Mexico, 10% 10, 10 are or can be in a stunt. Whereas in the obesity in the same age category, we can see that there's not really a trend in this, uh, in the, the, the trend that we saw in the adult of the school uh, children, in the five, in the lower, in the younger than five years old, we don't see like a clear trend. Now, but the, but the problem is that this also very heterogeneous when we see these stunting estimates across different uh, quintiles of socioeconomic status, we can see that among the lowest or the poorest part of the population, we can see very important proportion of prevalence, even in the 2012, with almost 26% of the children with, uh, with the stars complete the stunting indicator. And when we see all the indigenous population, 30% of them, when we stratify by rural and rural, 31% of the rural po population or the rural children are with the starting uh, So what's the, uh, there's been a lot of about how to characterize these two different problems of the same spectrum of nutrition. Uh, so there's been this call the double burden of nutrition, dual burden of nutrition or malnutrition. Sometimes also called the triple because it includes or, or differentiate between the caloric on the nutrition and the macronutrient and macronutrient. Well, those are on the nutrition and the other stream is the, is the overnutrition. So the way to characterize this is the coexistence of these two problems at the different levels. So at the population level, I think it's clear, the data that I just showed is clear that at the population level, there's important coexistence. There's some part of the population with other nutrition problems and some part of the population with overweight and obesity. But there's a lot of also very important interest of understanding if this dual burden is also at the household level. And one of the definitions of this dual burden at the household level is when the mother is obese or overweight and their children, so one of the children is stunned. And, and also there's a lot of interest about the individual level. You know? and, and, and this is more difficult to characterize, but there's when there's overweight and obesity, even in the adult or the child populations, but with any evidence of micronutrient deficiency, and one of the you know, best indicators of more available indicators is anemia. Uh, so all these are a good indicator of this rapid transition, of how the population is rapidly changing diets and lifestyle and going from other nutrition to excess calorie intake. But clearly it poses conflict challenges for, for the policies. And I don't know, this is more like just thinking about because maybe different or depending on the level where the dual problem of disease, maybe the problems will need to take into consideration different strategies. So for the national, this the interest that all the strategies need to be very importantly targeted to the people who need them. And that has been a problem in Mexico and in many other uh, low milling countries where you have a problem with food fortification or, or food supplies and, and that affects all population without a clearly in terms of focusing where, the, where is the need really defined. When you see the household level, that's more complicated because at the end, if you have increased your food supply to the household, uh, 
So you really need to understand that this food supply will increase the calorie intake to both children and adults, and maybe the adults are already obese and need to be. And the individual levels, uh, maybe that's a way that we probably will need supplementation and specific foods that are specific for children. No? And maybe that will uh, clearly need more food technology. Uh, on the other hand, there's another interesting issue here in the dual volume is the evidence that other nutrition uh, in, in both in utero and in the first two to three years of life uh, is associated with a risk of non communicable disease. This was an observation. Uh, Dr. Becker saw it this and characterized that in the, in the UK around the 70s, 80s, where he found that low birth weight was clearly associated with a risk of, of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So this seems to be true. There's a lot of interest in this, uh, understanding why. But that would explain that both extremes of the malnutrition at the end will impact also in the non communicable disease. So what the data we have for the dog burden in Mexico, this is a report that colleagues from the National Institute of Public Health uh, use. There's a good supplement about these, all that in you know, like eight or nine Latin American countries try to use the same indicators. And this is the data coming from the, the National <coughs> Survey of Nutrition and Health 2012. So this is the same similar data that we are, I already showed to you that at the population level, it's clear that there is, for, I mean, this is for the for the overweight and obesity, children under five years old, children between five and 11 years old, and uh, I think this is only women because it's a comparison because in the 1988 survey, we only have women at this age. So and we can see the increments importantly in the overweight and obesity. You know, overweight is the darker one and the light one is on the other hand, in the anemia estimates that we already have, we can see that uh, for children we have like 23% with, with data or can be uh, characterized or can be named as anemic in the children population. 23% is the prevalence of anemia, 10% among the school age children, and 11% among the reproductive age mothers. And in terms of the stunting among children, we can see the, the decrease, but it's still 10%. What about the household level? So they found, with the same data of the survey, that 8.4% of uh, households had uh, stunt children with a, a mother with overweight or obesity. And that clearly increased in the rural areas almost to 5, 15% of the households. And I don't know if it was this calculation about if this is what we should expect. I think they did something that I am not totally convinced, they just calculate the expected uh, a proportion of these households given the probability of a household having a mother with obesity and a probability of a household having a son with the national estimates and the multiplication of these two estimates. So at the end they say, well, this is not really, this is lower than expected. But I think we should be expected much more I mean, this is not an independent process. So, so even they, they conclude that this is lower than expected. I think the 80% and the 50% in rural areas is something that we need to consider when we define uh, intervention. And in the individual level, uh, it's also lower estimates, but it's still 7.5 women with anemia and overweight and obesity, 2.9 children with anemia and stomach. So why, and just changing to the nutritional transition that is the main driver of this, of this epidemic of obesity and this dual border as well. Uh, so uh, the nutritional transition is a term that was coined, I think, by, by Barry Potkin. Uh, uh, he's an economist and uh, was interested in nutrition problems since the 70s. And he's now getting a lot of in, in contact with uh, with the agriculture and food policies. And, and it really, why this, the, the people is changing their diet and one of the main factors was urban environment. 
urbanization. But as we can see here in Mexico, and in I suppose and in many other developing countries, is that not only urbanization changes in lifestyle, but also we can see that in the rural environments, we can see these urbanized rural environments where we have a lot of access to processed foods, even in a very rural community. Not just so, so at the end, there's a lot of uh, possibility of changing diets even in the rural communities. Uh, changes in the food chain values. There's a lot of important changes, and this is probably, uh, and they will increase the access to processed foods. And, change, and that will, the result of that will be cha changes in diet, something that is called the Western diet, and, the, and, uh, and physical activity. These are the, the, the main characteristics of these changes in diet, where this increased consumption of high energy dense foods, high in sugar, in general, there's a lot of increment, increases in consumption of processed food. Increase in, in, in sugar beverages, increase in animal products, increase in refined grains, and high glycemic carbohydrates. Decrease in fiber and whole grain, and increase in physical inactivity, sedentary behaviors and no active transport. It is, uh, I mean, why some of the drivers of these, of who's pushing this, is an active promotion of the consumption of the healthy foods by food industry, that's been characterized. And there's another issue that has been integrating that lack of adequate support in other sectors, such as health, agriculture, and transport. So this is uh, just a scheme of uh, what the possible, possible causes of nutrition translation and the emergence of obesity. I mean, clearly, there's a disassociated with economic development, you know, but also with inequalities in, in, in health and in access. And urbanization, and these are the main players, food security, adversity, increases in expensive uh, vegetable oils, exposure to media, eating away from home, physical demanding jobs, authorization, sedentary recreation, and opportunity for physical activity are low. And that will increase or to balance the in the income of and output input and output of calorie and produce the obesity. So how is these changes in Mexico? This is data from the 2012 adults in the lowest quintile. And and we can see here that that we just divide and I think basic food groups, something that we call discretion of foods, that are mainly sweet and beverage and high and sugar added products. So 25% of the calories intake in the population is coming from this discretion of foods, 75% from the basic foods. But even in the basic foods, for example, grains that are and cereals that are the main uh, calorie, uh, the main contributor of calorie intake, uh, there's a good proportion of refined grain that is that is producing this uh, uh, the, the, this calorie intake from from cereals. The, the, the legumes are low. The, the standards, the daily are some in the milk. The meats are in this, and also fruit and vegetables are very low in terms of uh, recommendations. Uh, and and another issue is that, that we try to characterize with the dietary assessment that we do have is trying to characterize the level of processing that foods. And this is complicated. There's been a lot of controversy about what we will call uh, processed foods. But in one estimate that we worked with Dr. Bobby Popkin in this paper, it was, I mean, what we calculated with the data in the 2012 that in the Mexico, in total, 58% uh, of the uh, calorie intake uh, is processed food. It's coming from, from processed food. Uh, and 42% from for non-processed. And when we see rural and rural environments, it doesn't change that that much. Are almost similar, very similar in terms of what going from processed food and what comes from unprocessed food. Mexico City a little bit more of processed food. One of the things that may be controversial is especially tortillas that, I mean, in this analysis, we characterize as a processed food because, I, I don't know, it's, uh, we do not have a specific question and we need to analyze that about 
what's the origin of the tortilla that is caught on the world population, probably you do have much more data to do that. And, but at least in some estimates, it's like a 98% of the flour that is used at the national level, it comes from refined grains or refined flour rather than from the, the, from the grain. So what, given this, what are the, the challenges and strategies for to address these both ends of the nutrition problem? So I just talked about the major nutrition programs for the more related to other nutrition in Mexico. You know? That is probably you know, uh, know very well this program, the Oportunidades Prospera program, that was a program to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. Okay? And that was is a is a cash transfer, conditional cash transfer program, and is conditional to incentive children education, nutrition and health. It has some 45 supplements, the Nutrisano and the Nutrivida, Nutrisano for children, Nutrivida for women, and, and there's a micronutrient fortification of some uh, uh, flour. And there's another similar program that is for, for isolated community, that is the PAL program, the Programa de Ayuda Alimentaria. Uh, and this is for rural communities where there's not a health, uh, health uh, facility because the health facility is mainly the facility who is organizing the opportunities program. Uh, the other problem that is in, uh, is the subsidized the Licorsa milk. I mean, uh, the Licorsa, the Licorsa is something, a problem that was in rural areas, uh, but mainly the Licorsa is something that, uh, a problem that fortified milk with iron, vitamin A, and other micronutrients, vitamin C. Uh, and, and the other the school breakfast that is mainly uh, uh, coordinated by DIF. And recently there is this integration of many of these programs to this national crusade against hunger. That is, I mean, uh, for me it's very, very difficult to understand what it is and, and how it that integrates all this. Apparently integrated the programs with a lot of effort to community participation, I think some some other strategies for food production, but I'm not very clear about what that is. I have a question. What, which areas do you include in rural areas? Which what? Areas or which regions do you include in, in rural areas? For the nutrition, for the survey, uh, that's communities below 2,500 habitants. Similar to the name. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, what specific are included in the sample? I'm not sure. It's just a representative sample of rural areas. I, I am not quite sure, for example, if you are talking about very isolated indigenous communities. Because in these communities, they are using these processed products because they don't have money, they don't have access, they are too far away from the small cities, from the village, mm -hmm. and then the situation is a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you will find very isolated communities with with no access to processed foods. Yeah. Uh, but it's getting, it's, it, I mean, you can see processed foods in very, very rural communities. That's, that's a fact. And this is a national representative sample. Okay. Maybe it doesn't sample all communities, it doesn't sample maybe a specific uh, community. This is a representative sample of communities or villages below 2005, 2,500. And do you think that this, and this Opportunities Prospera program is really helping the people from the nutrition point of view when you are giving money to the persons and they decide what to buy? Yeah, so, so that's part of the problem. So I will just talk about that a little bit and then, and then we can continue the discussion. So this is the coverage of the program. Yeah, as you can see, 40% of the household in Mexico receive at least one of the programs. Uh, Opportunidades is clearly the program with, uh, with the highest coverage, 20%. You know? uh, and Licosa, 
this is the, the, the food, the breakfast uh, at schools, and this other small program there. And, and when we can see, so there's a, when we see how, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, socioeconomic status, you can be more rural than urban areas. You know? And there's been an effort trying to target to the, to the population that really needs it. You know, but still, we can see that there's, I mean, people in, in higher quartiles receive 50, 20 percent of people receive programs. So there's a lot of the impact evaluation of these programs. I think the, the, the important in, the, in terms of the opportunities, I think they have found a positive effects on children growth. Not much, but I think part of this uh, uh, decrease in the prevalence of stunting I mean, part we can we can argue that is because of opportunity. And but it's, it's interesting because at the end, when they try to evaluate the diet of the population that is not coming from the nutrition or the supplements, the diet is not very good. You know? So we are giving, in addition to the cash transfer, we also giving these nutrition and supplements. So probably the impact is given because of the nutrition. And the cash transfer is trying is potentially modifying diets to something more processed, and but that probably will happen also with with the strategies from the food, uh, uh, <coughs> the food in terms of, of trying to increase uh, crops cash crops, you know, to see well if that will increase or, or have a better diet or not. Uh, the subsidized milk clearly has. I mean, there's some impact evaluation that have been in terms of decreasing the iron deficiency and the reduction of anemia. And probably the worst of the problems is the school breakfast, where there's not very clear about what should be given. Uh, I mean, many children consume these. There, before there was a lot of sweet breads and things that was not very healthy, and now they're trying to change a lot of <coughs> healthy choices. Having in terms of the level of nutrition, uh, we have like a two, two, the national agreement of obesity prevention. It's like it's a huge problem in the schools, trying mainly to regulate the food availability, soda consumption, and comida chatarra, snack foods in schools. And the other is more like the national strategy that has many lines of action uh, for obesity. That is implement uh, food labeling and that it's been very difficult to have a good food labeling here so we do not have one uh, children food marketing re regulation also very behind on that taxes uh, for healthy products to increase the price and decrease the consumption promote public awareness of importance of diet promoting physical activity promoting breastfeeding among other <coughs> actions uh, so the main idea of the strategy of the programs to reduce obesity is to tackle or to decrease the obesogenic environment rather than just promoting good lifestyles among the population. Uh, one of the variations that is more recently is the is the tax. There was this tax in the sugar and beverage in 2014. Uh, it was a 10% increment in the price with this tax. And using data, I mean, this is a colleague also from the Institute, Alexa uh, Colchero, she estimated that the average use of 6% of tax revenue purchase during the 2014, that is a very small amount of production. And this reduction reached 12% after one year of the taxes. And, and it was this. A reduction in the in the in the so what will be estimated if we model that reduction in terms of calories uh, we might see is a model study that they estimate uh, for 400,000 will these tax will decrease 400,000 new cases of diabetes by 2050 which is a long time and not very it's a very small amount of impact so there's been discussion about how if we should increase the tax to 20 percent rather than just saying that it doesn't work. And do you think this impact will what will provide will we will keep this impact in different years or just only the years that we have been taxed 
as that we were used to these tax and we will consume again a lot of these papers. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of new data coming from, I mean, this is from the first year of the tax, yes. now that we have two years of taxes. They were trying to analyze, again, did this analysis using uh, the, the it's, a, it's a data, it's a private data coming from the industry. Actually. So, so it's a complicated data because it's very, it's very difficult to estimate at the national level the consumption of, of or street and beverage, you know? So what do I think? I, I think it will, it will, I mean, the elasticity data that we do have for, for, for street and beverage was very strong and consistent, you know? The estimate of the elasticity, so it seems that street and beverage is an elastic product. And so, but maybe 10% is not good enough. I mean, we should probably increase it much more than 10% in order to have much greater income. Just one question. The tax is only on the beverage, but not on, on the sugar itself? Well, there's another tax. I mean, there's two, like, taxes to the soda, to the sugar, and there's a taxes that was directed to high-density foods, what is chatarra and no, no, consumption. And, then, and now there's an evaluation. I haven't, I, there was an evaluation, and it seems to have also an impact. The taxes in terms of the snack, high density snacks. <coughs> yeah. But in terms of, there was a lot of discussion of trying to put a tax given the sugar content of any food. But that was like very complicated to, to do at the end. So the decision was targeting to the food rather to the sugar as the sugar side. And one of the concerns were, was like. Uh, the, the, the possibility of the increase of informal uh, production of food, of this chatarra, yeah. yeah? So the, this is very well uh, documented by the, in, the, the formal mm -hmm. industry. with a little compliance and also very not very strong evaluations of this. So the only more stronger evaluation was the tax. So just to conclude, the, despite this, the success of policy but to combat under the nutrition, there's still high prevalence in, especially in the poorest populations. And the prevalence of obesity is clearly increasing because <coughs> one of the of uh, of the largest in the world. Uh, the transformation of diets, one of the main issues here is that it cannot be solved only with nutritional education. I mean, it's not come frutas y verduras. It's not, not just an education of trying to improve the knowledge of a healthy diet. You know? We really need to understand the structural determinants, the environment that are really promoting these, these diets. So we need multi-sectorial problems. While increasing awareness of this drug burden, and I think I'm, you, you, you will, I'm very very sure of what you're doing, but our impression is that most of the interventions from the agriculture is still very focused on, on food security as a, as a driver of the programs. And so we need to think about how to combine the food security that is a problem, but with the over calorie intake that is also a problem. So I think it's an urgent need to integrate nutrition and food system policies to tackle the double border. But first we need to understand, and I think we cannot understand, we do not understand it. So one of the reasons why I'm here is because we start working with Brittany Santiago in the CIMIT, Julian in the SEAD in Sonora, and myself in ISP 
uh, we put a proposal together with uh, integrated proposals with these three objectives to determine how agriculture practices and consumption acts in Mexico have contributed to both extremes of malnutrition. Identify the, the data gap to integrate agriculture, uh, nutrition, and health assessment at different levels, at different scales, uh, from individual and household levels. So the idea is, that is mining that data mining of what data we do have, trying to understand if we do have sufficient information to understand diet at the rural scale, or why these are changing. And maybe to have or to design an integrated assessment of having both in the same communities. We are very interested in rural communities where this change is occurring. And to understand how people take decisions of the money, in terms of how they spend in diet, how they and their food production for their own consumption. So, so we are very excited of having this. I hope we can have a good news soon about the fund. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know you tried. I didn't. Yeah, the time. Does anybody have any other questions for us? So, um, I was really interested in the, the increase in processed foods. Do you know if people are just eating more food or if there are certain traditional products that are being replaced with a new, cheap, commercial alternative? Yeah, I mean, if you see that, I mean, there's a lot of replacement. Yes, I think. I mean, there's another data about replacing traditional, or having more unhealthy traditional foods, and I mean, the, the use of oils of, of uh, lower quality, you know, and so that, that's one of the examples of how traditional foods is also getting worse in terms of quality. And, but also I think they're increasing because the, the availability and the access is just, just in front of you, so, so I think there's an increase in consumption as well. I mean, th this, these estimates that are very difficult because in general, when you estimate the calorie intake of the population, you see a decrease. That's the average. I mean, the average, the calorie intake in the population is decreasing. But however, the way we do have to estimate calorie intake is are not very good. I mean, it's good. So, so we do have these 24 hours recalls. Uh, so that's a more precise estimate. Yeah. But it's just one, probably two days, that maybe is representative of that. Very uh, but not that much. The other assessment that we use is the food frequency questionnaire that is a very bad, it's more than for quality rather than for, for quantity. So it's very difficult to, to really assess the quantity of of, diet, of, of food and calories that you take. And are there any specific food categories or pro types of products that are, have changed? Like for example, I don't know, in the UK we might have a switch from different type of bread or yeah. is there anything? Yeah, I mean, one of the nice examples, and I think we need to characterize better, is the tortillas yeah. changing for bread. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, tortillas changing for bimbo bread. Mm -hmm. is, uh, that is increasingly important. No? And the tortilla is increasing, actually. No? Mm -hmm. So we use that. So, and the changing from mixed amount tortilla to flour, refined flour. Tortilla, that's another important. Uh, I want to continue with one, with, uh, one of the questions of uh, my colleague. Uh, we just uh, recently uh, uh, finished a, a, a study in one indigenous population from Sonora, it's from the contact or city, uh, and we model the BMI. Uh, we study diet and physical activity and some social program. Um, uh, just want to share yeah. that one of the uh, in, in in two different models, one of the independent variables related with increasing BMI was Prospera or opportunity. Yeah. You know, besides uh, tra the consumption of dietary part, traditional dietary part as a protector, a westernized pattern as a risk factor, uh, having own car was a risk factor. <coughs> and doing vigorous physical activity as a protector, but 
just want to share that <coughs> this kind of problem in Fedos protect, you know, uh, as was created, was affect, is affected, and is related with the common process. Yeah. But I think this, I, I, I've seen this like a, a experience in some advantages, the way that Prospera is potentially uh, increasing calorie intake and, and obesity. But these evaluation programs come from the panel within the Oportunidades, that is a 10 years panel. It's a very important and nice panel, I think, in terms of the evaluation of the entire program. But I'm sure that this has been some specific places where it comes. But in general, you can see there's an impact on growth, <coughs> an impact on anemia, uh -huh. but are not clearly impact on increasing obesity. That's that's the thing that they showed in the last evaluation. It is important to have this kind of uh, result just to yes. to to, to share with good. this uh, this panel. And Don't agree. No, no. I think it's very important. Yes. We are in process of production. Yeah, I have always been working in groups with the biological scientists. <coughs> I think I'm the only social scientist here. I think uh, there are many important uh, efforts to analyze this uh, kind of themes, but there is one that is, I think, behind all this, which is uh, <clears throat> something that maybe you don't uh, see clearly, uh, the racism. What has to do with racism in this thing? It has a lot to do. I just received one uh, video today made by Coca-Cola against Trump. And uh, um, supporting Mexico in this fight. Do you know what Coca-Cola loses if Mexico uh, make a campaign against Coca-Cola? What has to do with racism? with this theme. All the discrimination and racism in Mexico is just the same what the Trump is saying now from Mexicans. Inside Mexico, <coughs> white people uh, are as racist as Trump with us. For about 15 years through television, you say that if you eat this junk food, you will be white, you will be wise, you will be handsome, you will be blue eyes. <laughs> you lose your traditional food and you begin eating junk food. Many of these programs, official programs, uh, are, they have uh, political um, purposes. All these, behind this, programs, there are very uh, specific uh, political interests for the political people in Mexico. All these efforts are very good, very important, but there is this kind of things which has to do with the social organization and economical model of the development in our countries, developing countries, which is not considered in this analysis, very important, very uh, very good analysis. The racism is something that doesn't uh, that uh, which is behind all these efforts. The Mexican uh, field, the poor Mexican field, is uh, abandoned for 30 years now from the political development. Uh, so I think this is one of the things we are going to see in this uh, uh, workshop here in the Skokko, in Sonora, and you will see the difference between the white people and the Indian people and the rural people and the peasant people, which is very important. I hope you can see this in all, in all these things. <coughs> Clarify the point you made about the supply of flour for tortilla. You said there's two major companies. Yeah. How is that organised in Mexico in terms of uh, flour processing? Uh, 
what, what is, I mean, is that, has that changed or what has it always been centralized in terms of? Of two major yeah. producers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the two major producers that have been in place is, I don't know, four years? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean this guy, like the two big companies, I mean, there's the, uh, that, that produce flour, uh, Nixta Malai's flour, corn tortilla, uh, flour, corn flour. Uh, it's just like a monopoly of this. Um, I mean, there was that, that change has come from having this traditional preparation of tortilla that is coming directly with the grains and they prepare soak it with a, with a, in a special uh, uh, water with with cow. Lime, and and that when they but now the the flour is is, is all over the place. So most of, so is is rich. I mean, it's some kind of there's a lot of fortification in this in this flour. I think there's not a very good formulation of the fortification. I mean, some there's a lot of heterogeneity. So it's supposed to be regulated, but it's not. Force is not is not there, there, there's not any evaluation that I have seen if these two big companies actually follow the fortification of this cloud. So so I think this is important. The other point I want to see is maybe the rate of increase, particularly in obesity time, it seems to have slowed down quite significantly. Is that what I think? No, I think I was showing more the obesity. Uh, I mean, the obesity. How obesity explains the mortality? No, the association. So it's not only the increase in obesity that is not really showing. It's more access to care. So, so these obese among the rich people have much better access to care. So they probably don't don't, don't die. So the rate of increase in diabetes and obesity. It's continuing. It's continuing. So it's, it's establishing. Yeah, it's establishing more in the in the in the highest condition. We haven't seen, haven't seen the decline the of the obesity prevalence yet. No, I think we will see it. No? Uh, but it's clearly uh, so. And the poor people is clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just first one comment about the question of region about the milling sector here in Mexico. For wheat, I don't know much about maize. Uh, the milling sector is quite complex. Mexico is a bread wheat grain uh, importer, but it's a durum wheat, uh, wheat exporter. But they have a big uh, milling sector and they don't need to, to import a lot of flour. Okay, And for wheat flour, there are different laws uh, I mean, uh, uh, fortification is done by law. I don't know if that is happening in all the mills, but the law uh, says that you need to fortify for iron thing, vitamin B, and folic acid. Okay, so that is about the fortification of uh, uh, wheat flowers. And I have a question for Rui. Thanks very much for the presentation, it was very nice. I wonder if you have any collaboration with other groups of other countries to compare your results and to find common solution between, uh, and if you are finding similar trends in other countries with the same grade of development of Mexico, or why are you working at the global level? Yeah, well, actually, I, I my personal work is not really at the global level. I, I used to work more in non-communicable diseases and with our own studies. No? Uh -huh. uh, we actually now initiate more like a Mesoamerican collaboration that that will so we just uh, have a fund from National Institute of Health to have like the planning grant of a Mesoamerican center and the idea is to start working with collaborative assessment of on many of these issues so so I hope I mean and when I was working with Santiago uh, they had this big project or you have this big project in Guatemala so the idea was trying to analyze also the data from Guatemala in a in a very similar way. way to, so we start working with with uh, Dr. Masariegos in in Cap in, in Guatemala. So that's where I think we will focus our international cooperation. And 
maybe I just complement the, the issue about maize, the industry of maize here in Mexico. We have, uh, yes, two big companies. Bruma uh, has been established here uh, 45 years ago. And uh, it's true, their market has expanded towards the rural areas. Uh, they, they give a lot of incentive to people to establish their own small uh, business. But uh, of course, uh, the condition is that they have to use the uh, nixtamalized flour. And that's why uh, the consumption has expanded. And also, uh, the, the lifestyle has changed. Uh, women are working more, so they don't have the time to do the, the traditional process, which is much more uh, beneficial in terms of uh, health and nutrition. And, um, and the masa tortilla industry, which is the other industry, the traditional one, is really decreasing in most of, of the urban uh, areas uh, in Mexico. It is a very time consuming, and we will see the process this afternoon, it's time consuming, and the new generations are not really interested to learn on, on that. Also because that industry has been really uh, informal. Yeah, it's something uh, the knowledge has been passed from generation to generation, but it's not, there is not a consolidated masa tortilla industry in Mexico. Uh, they keep fighting <laughs> each other, and, and they are not really consolidated. And that's another reason why the, the flower uh, industry has uh, increased and has propagated more. Saying that, of course, there are some areas in the country where still people are dem demanding the traditional nixamalized tortilla, and uh, the use is being uh, increased, and uh, now is being seen as a, as a specialty food kind of thing, yeah? But there are specific niches for that. Not many people demand the nixamalized tortilla these days. We are given another later. Something very important is the composition of the industry in Mexico, the Mexican industry. More than 90% of the Mexican industry are tortillas. And these are very macro industries, familiar industries. Then it is very important, not only from the point of view of nutrition, it is only very important from the economic point of view what we do with these tortillerias. really set the stage for the workshop and it's clear that there are a lot of opportunities for researchers across crop, food, health, nutrition, um, social sciences to work together to address these health challenges. Uh, so now, um, yeah. should we move on to the yeah. breeder? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. so now we'll have a chance to meet some cement breeders and um, they'll discuss some challenges and um, ensuring nutritional quality while maintaining other important traits uh, like crop yield. Yeah, so just let me introduce the, 